A few years ago, there was a study that was done and it suggested that by the time a person was 18 years old, they would have seen more than 300,000 commercials on television. And all of these commercials have one central and consistent message. That if you want to live a better life, you need to rush out and buy this. Isn't that the basis of all the commercials? You ever seen anybody frown in a commercial? I don't care what it is. They're yeah, always so happy. It makes their life so much better. But in order to get all of that stuff that the commercials teach us that we really want to have to have that better life, that means we just got to go out and we've got to work a little longer. We got to work a little harder so we can have a little more money so we can get our hands on all of that stuff. I mean, after all, everybody else is going to have one. They're going to get it. We don't want to be left out. So, we got to work a little harder. we got to work a little longer to make sure we don't get left behind. Because I have just got to have that new phone, even though I just bought one two years ago. Or well, that new laptop. Laptop. Everybody else is getting it. Or I need to buy one of those new little ga exercise gadgets or gadgets. Man, they keep coming out with new little ones, particularly in the first couple months of every year. <clears throat> Got to have one of those or else everybody be skinnier than me because I didn't get that gadget. Or I need that new car. All those people in the car commercials. Oh, there's some expensive cars. They're all smiling. You know why? Their coupon book hasn't come in yet. <laughs> gotta have that new car. Gotta have that new boat. Gotta have that new appliance. Man, I gotta keep up with everybody else. Everybody else is getting all that stuff. We call that keeping up with the Joneses. Let me tell you a little secret about that. The Joneses are working just as hard to keep up with you. They're working harder too. <clears throat> See, it doesn't stop. And so Preacher Solomon wants us to stop and look at the labors, what it is that we work so hard for and why we work so hard. Today we're going to look at, he gives us three avenues to look at in our lives. And we're going to look at the first one today. He wants to talk about uh, um, uh, this particular was his work. Next week we'll look at the second one, uh, which is worship. And the third one, the week after that, has to do with wealth. Okay, they all start with W, so it makes it easy for us to remember, or at least me. Today we're going to look at work. Remember, he's examining the human experience. So if you have your Bibles in chapter 4, 4 through 16, 4, 4 through 16 in the book of Ecclesiastes. He says, I have seen every labor and every skill which is done. It's the result of rivalry between a man and his neighbor. And this too is vanity and striving after the wind. The fool folds his hands and consumes his own flesh. One handful of rest is better than two fists full of labor and striving after wind. And then I looked again at the vanity under the sun. And there was a certain man, without a dependent, having neither a son nor a brother, yet there was no end to all his labor. Indeed, his eyes were not satisfied with riches. And he never asked, and for whom am I laboring and depriving myself of pleasure? And this too is vanity. And it's a grievous task. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there's not another one there to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? 
And if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. And a cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. A poor yet wise lad is better than an old foolish king who no longer knows how to receive instruction. For he has come out of prison to become king, even though he was born poor in his kingdom. I've seen all the living under the sun throng to the side of the second lad he replaces him. There is no end to all the people, to all who were before him. And even the ones who will come later will not be happy with him, for this too is vanity and striving after the wind. He wants to talk about working and striving and toiling and laboring and why we do it. And he starts off by talking about that scenario of keeping up with the Joneses. That's why he starts off with says, when I'm looking at all the toil and struggle you, uh, and, and striving that's there, he says, you know, it's basically a rivalry between a man and his neighbor, each one trying to updo the other one, or at least keep up with the other one. He's got a zero turn tractor long more, I gotta have me one of them. They got nice flower gardens in the front of I gotta have some nice flower gardens, or else my yard won't look as nice. They got a double oven, they can cook twice as much food. I need a double oven. And he said, it's just a rivalry between people. And he says, basically, most of the stuff that we're working so hard for is because we're in a rivalry, trying to keep up with everyone else all the time. I remember when, when the internet stuff all first came out, man, and every, remember dial-up? Everybody remember dial-up? Man, everybody was so excited. I mean, it would take forever. You had to wait and wait and wait before you finally go, right? Remember that? But then, people started getting Wi-Fi. Now, I can't get Wi-Fi even to this day at my house. Okay? So I had dial-up for a long time. Now I just use my phone as a hotspot. But I didn't even know that I could do that. But people would be talking to me, and I, they'd say something, and i said, yeah, it takes me a little while because I have dial-up. Oh, my gosh, you'd have thought I had a terminal disease. <laughs> Oh, we're so sorry. They're sending me cards. Because I didn't have the newest and the latest like everybody else. And got to work harder and harder so we can have it. He says basically all this work and that we do so much of it is because we're trying to keep up with everybody else or outdo everybody else. You know, the Tenth Commandment tells us not to covet the things of our neighbor. Now, this is more than, we, we often apply this to, oh, if, that, if my neighbor has a cow, that means I want his cow. That's not necessarily what it means. It means my neighbor has a cow, so I need to have a cow. We're coveting what your neighbor has, not necessarily the actual thing, but we got to have one, too. And that's the, and we say, well, I don't covet my neighbors. Yes, you do. Yes, we do. You ever thought, man, I'd like to be just like him. Man, I wish I could sing like her. Except with a deeper voice. I wish I could do, remember, how many times have you ever thought that? That's coveting. That's coveting. And when it comes to physical things, we work harder to get them. And that's the little carrot that's dangled in front of us by our materialistic, consumer-driven economy. This desire that we have to work more, to work harder, what's the old saying? That you work harder to buy things that you don't need to please people you don't really like with money that you don't have. This desire <coughs> perverts our perception of work is supposed to be. God has given us our work. So Solomon wants to give us some examples. And so here in this little passage, it's kind of jumbled up because in the middle of it, he gives us two proverbs and gives us two parables to make his point. And so as you're reading through, it seems like he's flipping channels. Okay? 
But really, he's making the point and he's driving it home and he's helping us to examine our perception of what work is supposed to be. And to examine how it is that we need to change that and look at work differently. And so the first one in verse 5, that's a little proverb that he gave us. You remember as we read through, it says, The fool folds his hands and consumes his own flesh. That's a proverb. So contrast, uh, one, he says, there's a striving rivalry between a, a guy and his neighbor. Fighting, constantly trying to outwork, outdo, outget each other. He says, that's a rivalry. But then on the other hand, he gives you the opposite spectrum. That's the guy that just kind of sits there waiting for stuff to fall into his lap. I ain't working at all. I'm just waiting for people to give me something. He said that's just as bad. That perception of work is just as bad. As a matter of fact, he calls it grievous. It's just as bad as spending night and day working, working, working to satisfy our selfish desires and, and Madison Avenue's temptations. He says it's just as bad to do nothing. So the proper attitude, he's making this point, the proper attitude has to be somewhere in between those two. Right? Now that makes sense, and that's what he says in verse 6. Another proverb. One hand full of rest is better than two fists full of labor, labor and striving after the wind. <coughs> the fool, he doesn't work. Remember, he got his hands folded. And the guy out there working, he's working with both hands. I give me this, give me that, give me this, give me that. And that's all he's doing is grasping and trying to collect and just pull it in. And he says, that's the two extremes. And the middle is how you want to look at your toil and work on this earth. The workaholic has both hands closed because they're trying to grab hold of everything. I work hard for this. This belongs to me. But it says the wise man would understand that he also needs to take hold of rest. And that term rest there means contentment. It means to be contented with what you have. Yes, he should rest. Yes, there needs to be times of refreshing. There needs to be times when he stops and, and, and builds and nurtures his, his relationships with other people and family. How many people other than me, spend a good part of their adult life working so hard that they barely had time for their kids. You get home late, you wolf down supper, you flop down on the reclining chair and turn on the television. I'm exhausted. Six days a week. Work, striving, because that's defined who I was. And because of that, I wasn't like the man, the wise man, who had one hand full of contentment and rest and the other hand for work. No. Both of my hands were grasping. Grasping and grasping. And he says that that describes your attitude towards work. Always trying to get more. Never contented with what you have. He says you're kind of like the guy in the first parable I'll give you. And that's in verse 8. Look at verse 8. Remember this when I read? There was a certain man without a dependent, having neither a son nor a brother, yet there was no end to all of his labor. Indeed, his eyes were not satisfied with the riches. And he never asked, for whom am I laboring and depriving myself of pleasure? He's talking about this guy. If, if you opened up your dictionary and you look, um, looked up workaholic, have his little picture right there. This describes this man. He was driven to be wealthy, to have riches, to have things, to be successful, to be prosperous. While he enjoyed the praises that he got from others. That is the hardest working man I know. Man, I used to love it when people would say that. I would work extra hard to hear that. Because that's how I was raised. That's how I was brought up. That's what, what I thought was value. You gained value by how hard you worked. And other people knew it. Man, to be recognized for that? It was like a, a, a badge of honor. To be working with both fists and full. But some was like, why in the world was this guy working so hard? Yeah, he was. 
Well, it wasn't to create a better life for his family. And it really wasn't to create a better life for himself. Because he wasn't contented. He had to keep working and keep, he couldn't stop. That's not a better life. And it wasn't a better life for his family. He said he didn't have a son to pass anything along to. didn't even have a brother. You know, if you didn't have a son, your brother would get the stuff. <laughs> there was nobody. He had no other family. Why? He's too busy working. I don't have time. And even if he had a family, he wouldn't have had any relationship with them. He was too busy. This is a picture of a misdirected and quite honestly, a wasted life. Because all the stuff that man worked for, in Solomon's example, couldn't take a single thing with him. And he was never satisfied. He was never content. And he died exhausted and empty. Solomon says, there is a better life for us. That God has a much better life for us. And then he describes a little bit about what it's like. It's, it's not us alone plugging away just trying to be better than everybody else and stronger than everybody else and, and put in more effort than everybody. That's not the better life. He said the better life is when you learn to do your work and do it with and for other people. And a lot of folks don't like to work with others simply because they don't want to share the credit. Or the rewards. Uh, Mother, please, I'd rather do it all myself. Remember that commercial? Solomon says that's foolishness. And he gives some examples, and we have like in those verses in, in number nine. And he, he says, first of all, two people can get a lot more done than one. If you've ever had to build something, and you had long boards, you know how hard it is to hold a board up that's 12 feet long and work on this end and figure out a way that you got to build something to prop that end up. Or you've got to tack this up to push this up so you can untack that and move that up to put this in the right position. Oh my goodness, if you just had another person there, it would have just been happening just like that. No, i got to do it myself. So I can brag to everybody that did it all myself. He said, two people, invite somebody to help you. Admit that you could use some help. You get it done a lot quicker. And you have time to be contented with what you did and to go build on your relationship with others. He also said, and he uses the example, because one of the hardest things that they had to do back then was to travel. Now for us, we just go out, put the keys in, and take off. But remember, back in this time, though, there were no things, there was no planes, trains, and automobiles. For them to get from one town to the, to the other was hard work, because they walked. In the heat, no air conditioning, bugs, okay, they had to, whatever they had to take, they had to carry on their backs. It was hard work. It was a difficult task. Well, some of the most difficult stuff they had to do was to travel, particularly if they had to travel for several days. And many of them had to travel many days. The Jews had to travel because they had to get to Jerusalem. Like, they might have lived 500 miles away, 100 miles away. They had to get there. And it was a long journey there. And a long, it was hard work. And he gives some examples. He says, listen, it's better to travel in pairs. Even Jesus sent the disciples out in pairs. He said, better to travel in pairs because if one guy trips and falls, sprains his ankle, whatever, you got another guy there to help him. So it's best if you got somebody else there, if you need an assistance. And he also said, you know, if you come under attack, one of the great dangers of traveling in those days were, were robbers. Because they had to travel up hills and stuff and go through rocks and crevices and stuff. And people would jump out from behind rocks before five guys want to rob them. He said, best, you know, there's safety in numbers. So it gives you a little extra protection. Find somebody to go with you to help you. And the other example he gave was cold. It would be really hot in the day, but it'd be cold at night. And remember, you, you weren't kind of bringing a tent, okay? And so basically, you would travel with the clothes you had on. They would have on some type of undergarment. They would have on some type of a, a long flowing tunic. And then they would usually have something, we think it was almost like a poncho kind, usually kind of a heavier, warm kind of outer garment. And so at nighttime, it was going to get cold. The only thing you had was that one garment, that outer garment. 
And so you lay in there and you put that one outer garment. It is, I mean, it's a wide, it's usually about six feet wide, almost a six by six piece of fabric, doubled over because it would fit around them. And so you'd be chilling because that's all you had. He said, no, it'd be better. Because if two people are there, they could double the garment and there's still plenty of room for both to get under. Two are better than one. Two garments are better than one. Two blankets are better than one, right, Marsha? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so the idea here is that we need to continue to build up our relationship to develop strong, lasting relationships with friends and family and those who are around us. Because it helps us in our day-to-day -day toils and activities. God said that it is not good for man to be alone. And that is true on so many levels. But if our materialistic obsessions, if those dictate and control the, uh, the, the, the timings and the opportunities that present themselves to us, then we're going to find ourselves just like the man in that parable. Having a lot of riches around us but being empty. We can find ourselves at the end of our lives surrounded by a bunch of plaques a bunch of awards, a bunch of trophies and toys, a bunch of bank accounts, a bunch of stock certificates. All of those things we work tirelessly to accumulate. All of those things we love so much. And not one single one of those things can love you back. That's not a good one. One other thing that came to Solomon's mind is he was looking at the endeavor of man and their work and their relationship to their labor. And he touched on it briefly before, but he acknowledges that not everybody works for just the material things. That a lot of people work for the accolades. Some people will take a job making the exact same money, but for a bigger title. The accolades. He says, this is vanity too. And he gives us that last little parable. And we find that in the last three verses there. I'm not going to reread it. Some people have attributed this to David. Because he became uh, king. And, and he was poor. But there's nothing in the scripture that said he spent time in prison. And the passage here mentions prison. And so other people say, well, this must be about Joseph. Because we all know that Joseph was thrown into prison for a while. He didn't get to become king. Remember, he was just the, the, the prime minister of Egypt serving under Pharaoh. So I don't think it's either one. I think it is, it's a parable. And the parable basically says there's a king, and he's old. He'd been a king for a long time, and he had grown to be very self-centered, figured he knew everything, said he wouldn't listen to other people, he wouldn't take advice, he was self-absorbed. And so everybody would kind of, man, we wish we had another king. And on the horizon, this young guy comes up through the ranks. Man, poor, been in prison, but he worked hard, pulled himself up, worked his way up the ladder. And people, oh, they were impressed at how hard he worked. That's one hard-working fellow, man. Look at him. Well, I wish he was our king. Our king is old, fat, and don't do nothing. Man, if we had that guy to be our king. And as he worked his way further up and further, eventually, guess what? They replaced that guy with this guy. And he became king. And all the people rejoiced, man. This, yahoo, we've got the right guy. This is God. And after a few years, they looked at that guy and went, yeah, we need to replace him too. We're tired of him. It doesn't matter how hard you work, what title you achieve, what goal you set for yourself. I'm telling you, it is short-lived. That all the success that we might gain from all of our hard work and all of our endeavors is that. It is short-lived. All the hours of pushing and fighting and struggling to make a name for ourselves. All the sacrifices that we choose to make while we are chasing the American dream. Which, let's face it, is to get more stuff. 
all of those things are done at the expense of our relationships with other people. Whether it be in our family or the people you climb over to get to the top at work. Folks, all the stuff that we work so hard for. And I know a bunch of you out there are retired, but you still work. Bless your Bible. Don't let any of it, whether it's, whether it's a paycheck-driven work or, or to meet other people's expectations, just remember that working and working and working deprives you of that other hand of contentment, the time that you have for relationships with other people. Don't sacrifice the one for the other, figuring one of these days you'll stop working real hard and you'll start working and being able to do this that day may not come. Or you become so ingrained in working and working and working that even when you stop drawing that paycheck, you'll still have to keep working and working because it becomes your sense of value and importance and purpose in life. And you still miss out on the hand of contentment and joy with the people that you have around you. Because I'm here to tell you in three generations, no one is going to remember any of your successes any of your accomplishments, any of your promotions, or any of your titles. So what is it that we should glean from Solomon's collection here of proverbs and parables and pronouncements concerning our labor, our working, our striving, our toiling, our efforts here on this earth? It's that the only standard of labor and work that we should have is God's standard, which is that balance of one handful of work and the other handful of contentment, peace, and rest. It's when we have developed that sense of contentment with the things that God has already given us that too often we forget about when we're busy working. And when we're able to do that, we will have more time to pursue in loving others and caring for others and more than enough time to build lasting, strong, devoted relationships with each other. And we'll have more time to offer ourselves in service to our Lord. And that is our reasonable form of worship, the Bible says. Down here, under the sun. God's standard of work is for us to have a better life. The words American dream are not in the Bible. God has a much better life for us. And it's the life that he desires for us to enjoy. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Lord, we ask forgiveness. Lord, we forget. So many times we've all said, oh, well, I can't do this because I've got to do that. And the problem is, we don't. We make choices. And so often the amount of work and toil and efforts that we do, we use those as those badges of honor, something to develop a sense of worth. But we have other options. Yes, we need to work. That's why we need to have one handful full of it. But Lord, teach us, show us, lead us to understand that that other handful needs to be handful of contentment with the things, not that we have to work for, but the things that you've already given us. And we don't enjoy them when we're too busy. Thank you for this lesson. Thank you for your loving grace. And thank you for your forgiveness. It's in Christ we pray. Amen.